I'm afraid that those opposite Mr Speaker are going to have to put up with the most deadly combination in post-war politics, Hawke and Keating. Keating uh, polled five votes ahead of Bob Hawke, 56 to 51. If uh, this was uh, 11 years ago, I'd be getting uh, pretty thoroughly drunk. <laughs> This is a victory for the true believers. was a disastrous year for Australia. Here in the nation's capital, government was paralysed as Hawke and Keating fought out a totally consuming battle for leadership. The paralysis struck at a time when the country was descending into its worst recession for 60 years. I would say that literally, literally, we threw that year away. Threw it away. We absolutely... And in a three-year government, and I mean, I've got to say, I still feel bitter and twisted about it. I do. Not nearly as much should have uh, happened in that 12 months as should have. No, no doubt about that. But it's a very, very easy uh, criticism to make of Bob Hawke when you look at what was going on within that government, where, in fact, people uh, were playing a role, a bit like guerrilla warfare, against the Prime Minister. Well, neither of them had much to be proud of, I guess, in terms of the way the whole issue was conducted. In terms of the electorate, I mean, and their reaction, it was pretty much a choice between arsenic and strychnine. The idea that the rest of us should beaver away and be producing tricks and say, well, how's this for an act and half that's over and now let me do another one for you and how's that one and what about another one and do this for year after year after year was Bob sort of adjudicating, giving marks, well, you know, that was no longer possible. Part of his whole argument, of course, was that Labor had had its term, or more than its natural term, and that uh, there was virtually no chance of winning the next election, and so if he didn't have a turn now, he'd never get it. It appears to be some sort of anti-aircraft fire. When Iraq triggered the Gulf War in January 1991, Keating's lunge for the leadership was stalled. He considered resigning from Cabinet, but the time was not right. The Keating office decided that, with the strength of the war behind Hawke, with the rise in the polls that he enjoyed from, from that, uh, with the Cabinet knuckled down to, to the preparation of the March industry statement, um, that it would just be counterproductive to make public the Kirribilli agreement. So in effect, we decided to keep mum and hope something would turn up. The Gulf War was a temporary distraction from ever worsening jobless figures. Hawke and Keating completely misjudged the state of the economy in March 1991, in their final act of professional cooperation, they slashed tariffs. I now announce the general level of assistance will be reduced from 10% and 15% in 1992 to a general rate of 5% by 1996. It was a decision that made the jobless queues longer. It was the first of a series of mistakes that fatally undermined Hawke's leadership. I thought... Uh... Uh, the phase down which we announced in March of 1991 was probably a bit quick, moving 15% tariffs to 5% tariffs by the year 1996. Uh, Keating and Hawke both took a different view uh, from me on that. 
and I didn't argue it in the cabinet because I knew I wasn't going to win. Uh, because they both rang me before the cabinet meeting. I said to Paul, look, I don't want this statement much unless you got it absolutely right. Because if you haven't got it right, we're going to be in lots of problems. And when I saw Bob in February, I more or less put that view. Said so you've got to make sure this is right. In retrospect, there's one one time I, I really felt that I didn't go in hard enough because I I just did not believe that they got the economy right, that they judged it right, and it made a hell of a difference to that statement. I mean, if the economy was on the upturn, then you could do a few few things in terms of tariffs and other policies. But if the economy was not, if the economy was was still groveling along in the bottom and prospectively going down further, and some of the things that they're talking about was going to compound the problem, would add no nothing to confidence. Now, orthodoxy won, but it was challenged quite significantly, I think. It was a, it was a, a good debate where, uh, without fear or favour, the line was challenged, and it should have been. If you look at what happened then a year later when Keating had the reins, while Keating had been taking the, uh, the orthodox line then completely, he wasn't taking it a year later. But in hindsight, that statement should have been a political statement. It should have been much more about the future, much more about the whole settings of policy than simply about industry policy. And I think had it been, we would have lost, we would have gained a year instead of lost a year in terms of the fight against the recession. I move that this House censures the Prime Minister for his lack of leadership and failure in economic policy, which has put a million Australians out of work. The opposition lashed Hawke mercilessly. His strident responses failed to inspire confidence. Well, visiting professor, look up the statistics of your recession, the one in which you guided the Conservative government, and you were unique, as we've said before. You were absolutely unique. And of course, when he always used to go one step too far. Oh, in Parliament, always used to, every time he tried to get a bit smart and sort of sling off at the opposition, and the, and the voice would go up that sort of extra, sort of half an octave. And, and you'd think, oh my God. And all his supporters would be hiding under their desks with paper bags over their heads. I mean, it was terrible. I must say, after that uh, shrill and excitable performance from the Prime Minister, it is no wonder that your own backbench are literally openly in the corridors of this place saying that it's time you win. Keating and his New South Wales right-wing mates agreed. They sent Graham Richardson in to threaten Hawke. The Kirribilli agreement on leadership succession would be leaked if the Prime Minister didn't step down. Uh, so uh, I realised then that, um, uh, that this was uh, fairly serious because by any measure Graham Richardson was an enormously powerful influence in the, in the right wing of New South Wales, uh, which had been a consistent supporting block of me. And so I knew that uh, we now had a reasonably serious situation. It was a case of either walk away and not mention the fact that we'd made an agreement at Kirribilli House. In other words, let, let Bob get away with it or stand him up. Hawke refused to step down, and in the late afternoon of May 30, Keating's patience snapped. In a highly agitated state, he stormed around to Hawke's office. The Prime Minister was in a meeting with Queensland Premier Wayne Goss and union leader Bill Ludwig. I knew he was by nature impatient, uh, but I must say I was rather surprised when he came bursting in and said, I've got to see you. And I said, well, uh, I'm sorry, Paul, I'll see you. Uh, you can see I've got uh, people here, and when I've finished with them, I'll see you. And so he huffed and puffed out, and uh, I went on with, with my meeting. And I thought that was the thing to do. It had come, the point, it had come far enough, the, you know, the, the obfuscation the obfuscation and the sort of duplicity had come far enough and I wasn't going to bear another minute of it. 
Well, then, when I'd finished, he, uh, the meeting with uh, Goss and Ludwig, um, he, uh, he came in and uh, just uh, very directly told me that he was, uh, he was going to challenge. And uh, I said, all right, that's uh, the way it's going to be, Paul. That was it. And it was his decision to challenge. He wasn't pushed into it by anyone. He just woke up one morning and said, I've had enough. This is it. It's on. And it's on now. I mean, he wasn't even prepared to wait a matter of weeks. It was all done very hurriedly. That night, the whole of Australia knew about the Kirribilli Agreement. The Keating forces leaked it to Channel 9. The Hawke-Keating leadership rivalry first surfaced back in 1988 when Mr Hawke refused to step aside in favour of his treasurer. But now I've learned that Mr Keating has given Labor colleagues details of an undertaking he says he received at the time from the Prime Minister. And I was just shocked. And I thought, I can't believe this. Because a lot of people try to fob it off afterwards, oh, well, it was just a political promise. But of course, it was nothing of the sort. It was a personal promise that Bob Hawke had made to Keating under the most intense circumstances. I thought uh, uh, there's probably at least two members of the caucus that were shocked by it. All the others was feigned shocked as part of the tactics, part of the justifications for stabbing a leader in the back, etc. This is AM, coming to you from Parliament House in Canberra. I'm Peter Thompson, good morning. As AM goes to air this morning, history is being made in the Labor caucus meeting at Parliament House. The caucus has assembled to make its most difficult choice since coming to government in 1983. I remember arriving at Parliament House uh, at about uh, 7 a.m., having gone to bed at about 4.30 a.m. that morning to see the whole of the Parliament enveloped in this very dense fog that only the city of Canberra seems to generate. And thinking to myself, this could be a uh, set from the Hound of the Baskervilles and listening for the Hound uh, over the moors and the tale of impending doom. For the first time, a serving Labor Prime Minister has been challenged. And for the first time, caucus meetings called to deal with the leadership have been fruitless. Nobody moved anything, so the meeting was closed. Well, uh, I didn't take the opportunity. The day was an anti-climax. Hawke and Keating circled each other, but neither would strike. All they agreed on was to set the following Monday as the time when the challenge would occur. The lobbying continued over the weekend. I mean, Bob... Bob was friendly and, uh, and, and fairly laid back and was calling because he was calling. I mean, and uh, Keating, this is the difference here, Keating. I mean, having a conversation with Keating at this stage is like running a marathon, you know. <laughs> and th just the intensity of the man. And I can remember the, you know, look, mate, you know, etc. But the, the last thing Paul said to me, I mean, really, really summed it up. But, and literally, I mean, sort of the hand came out. I'm 3,000 you know, kilometres away in, in Darwin, but the hand came out of the end of the telephone, sort of grabbed me. And Paul said to me, this is on Sunday night, he said, listen, mate, I don't want your vote tomorrow. I want your soul. And I can remember saying to him, oh, would you settle for my body? But he wasn't in a very joking mood. <laughs> Overwhelmingly, the editorials and the political columnists and much of the comment came down for Keating. And uh, it was uh, quite astonishing, the wave of support that appeared. What, what sort of adjectives could you describe the role of the media June to December 1991. Craven, bloodlusting, incompetent, biased, bigoted, none of them adequately described the way Hawke was treated by the gallery, nearly all the gallery. Monday, June 3. Morning, all. Caucus assembles again. This time, the battle will happen. This morning, Paul Keating will almost certainly be the loser in the caucus room vote at 10 o'clock. The Prime Minister Bob Hawke has beaten off the leadership bid by Paul Keating and the former Treasurer and Deputy Prime Minister has headed for the back bench and perhaps out of politics altogether. There was a party held in Keating's office that night which if any, any stranger had attended they would have assumed that Keating had in fact won that 
June challenge. I mean, the atmosphere was uh, uh, a joyous one, um, and uh, the drinks flowed till late in the evening. And the uh, just the feeling that uh, this was this wasn't it wasn't over yet. I mean, Bob then had the opportunity. He had me out of the way. He had the leadership uh, uh, intact. Um, he had enough of a margin to stick in there. He then had what he wanted for so long, the chance to kick the ball himself and not be kicking it with me or looking at me, over his shoulder at me. Uh, and they sat down and produced a budget, and etc. But, you know, I, I doubted they'd get, he'd get the zing back into the thing. And it subsequently he didn't, of course. In his own colourful way, he said to me one day that he was in the coffin and we forgot to put the nails in the lid. Uh, and in a sense, I think he's right about that. Uh, but he got out of that coffin and was able to, to fight another battle. Keating cried havoc and let loose the dogs of war. Ruthlessly, remorselessly, Keating supporters like Gary Punch and Chris Schott created an atmosphere of crisis constantly carping at every every meeting at every social occasion constantly bagging hawk uh, leaking out leaking constantly to the gallery trolling through upstairs in the second and third floor with the latest story to hurt hawk that is destabilization of the most worst and the most disloyal, disloyal kind and uh, I just uh, have absolute contempt for that behavior and there was leaking to the press and briefing to the press and the sort of affirmation of uh, their intention to fight it out with the, uh, with the worst uh, offender actually saying in the office of one of my supporters, uh, uh, we'll go on with this, uh, we'll take the government into opposition if it's necessary. Uh, and uh, it's almost impossible to measure just uh, how debilitating that sort of attitude and those sort of activities were. Two weeks after the challenge, Coronation Hill in Kakadu National Park became the focus of frustration over Hawke's leadership. Following years of indecision, Cabinet finally had to make up its mind whether mining should be permitted in this place or not. Five and a half hours, we slogged it out, toe to toe, Bob Hawke and me. And with a, I mean, the long, great deal of, 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 I have to say, intense involvement by other cabinet ministers. I mean, probably, I think, and since I don't think there's ever been a more intense, hard-fought cabinet debate in the history of the Hawke government than that Coronation Hill debate. The local Aboriginal people were opposed to mining on religious grounds. Many in Cabinet were not convinced by their arguments, but Hawke was. As I said uh, in the Cabinet debate and said with some passion, indeed, ferocity, um, the hypocrisy of people who claim adherence to the Christian religion, who can easily accommodate the mystery of the Holy Trinity, pouring scorn upon the beliefs of others because it doesn't make sense just left me appalled beyond measure. And uh, I know that uh, many in the Cabinet, including some of my own supporters, were uh, angry about the passion that I displayed in that debate, more passion than I displayed than at any other time of my Prime Ministership in a Cabinet meeting. Hawke behaved very poorly at that meeting. He misjudged it, essentially. And he made a speech which alienated his supporters. I think he argued the case uh, atrociously on that occasion. And, the re and I remember it because that was a rare occurrence. I don't think his brief was good, and he didn't argue it well, in my view. At the end of all this, I mean, people just sat there in total silence. And there, there was Bob sitting there, stuffed. There's three quarters of his cabinet lined up against him, and he sat there, silent, silent. And I and I was sitting there, th like, 
thinking, well, what's going to happen now? I didn't know. And uh, I thought, well, something's got to happen. And the, and the seconds ticked past, and he just sat there. And everyone looked at him. And finally, I can story, he put his head down, and he sort of, he said, oh, oh well, oh, well, uh, you know, if, if people feel, you know, that strongly about it, and, and if, you know, and if, oh, well, you know, if, if that's how intense people feel about it, well, you know, maybe, and this, maybe we should have another look at it. So that's what did it. That's what really, that's what triggered Kimov. What I said at the time really to Bob was, um, OK, well, look, we've talked this out as far as we can go. This is a point of time when it doesn't really matter uh, what uh, we all as individual ministers feel. You've all heard, you've heard our views. Basically, this is now a matter for you. And Kim leant across the table and, and, and pointed his finger at Hawke. And he said, listen, Bob, make a decision. It's make a decision. Just devastating stuff for Hawke. I mean, this coming from Beasley. In other words, he was saying to him, listen, you bloody gormless little shit, do something. And, and everyone knew that. And we're waiting for you for leadership, Bob. That's what he was saying. Lead. There was a tenseness at that meeting, which you had to go back a long way uh, to find. Uh, the Prime Minister, obviously, uh, had really put his authority uh, on the line on that issue. And, of course, it may have been the first time in the history of, of the Hawke years where that may not have necessarily worked. And Hawke said, and everyone sat there, so Hawke said, close it down. And people, and you could hear it, the room, there was just this audible, people just said, oh, shit. Right around the room. And, and, and of course, normally, courtesy, unless the Prime Minister's going off to a press conference or something. I mean, people normally remain seated until he leaves. And people just started walking out of the room. If, against my expectations, uh, the Cabinet had sought to push it to a vote, and if they had, the numbers would have been against me on this, then I believe that I would have given very serious consideration to resigning because uh, it was just something that uh, went to the most profound of, uh, of, of my beliefs and I, I could not, I think, have been associated with, uh, with a decision uh, that went that way. What hung in the air over all of it, of course, was the leadership. The leadership. Vice President of the US SR, Gennady Yanayev, took office from Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev because Gorbachev is unable to perform his presidential duties. The Soviet army is on the streets of Moscow, and the worst fears of supporters of democracy have now been realised. August 1991, a bad time for leaders. Tanks in the streets of Moscow signal the beginning of the end of Mikhail Gorbachev. A day later in Australia, a budget is delivered by new treasurer John Kerrin that will signal the beginning of the end of Bob Hawke. The task we face is to ensure that the recovery proceeds at a sustainable pace and that we lock in the economic gains of the past year. These gains relate particularly to the current account and the rate of inflation. Treasury was opposed to fighting the recession by spending more and going for growth. This, combined with a wretched fear of Paul Keating, meant Kerrin produced a budget that failed economically and politically. It was a disappointing year. The budget, budget was pathetic. And Bob's mini economic statement at Christmas was so, so meaningless that he could, could have forgotten about giving it. And I thought, well, no, this, isn't, this shouldn't happen. And I'd argued strongly with Kerrin but more importantly with Rolf Willis over all that period. And the faith I'd had with Rolf, I had I'd always supported him and liked him, and actually believed in him for a great number of years. I, I found him and John Kerrin leading, leading Australia's economic performance into a hole. I just thought it was terrible. We were bound to put in place 
the Keating budget, which was agreed on May 22nd, uh, the whole budget strategy, we knew we couldn't divert from that. And uh, I, some of us didn't think that was really appropriate, um, particularly as we became, became closer to budget day and got more and more information. And what uh, stuck in John Kerrin's craw uh, as this developed, of course, was the fact that the basic framework and strategy of the budget was formulated by Paul Keating himself. As we'd had the first meetings, the first budgetary preparations, with uh, Paul Keating still as treasurer. If we'd have diverted greatly from that, um, the Keating forces would have used that on the right and the swingers. Uh, heading his way, saying that all the years of discipline and very good policy were being thrown away. So we thought we were caught, and uh, the ERC and Cabinet had agreed to the budget strategy. Well, certainly the ERC had. Paul Keating and his supporter John Dawkins were thoroughly determined to exploit Hawke and Kerrin's failure of nerve. Keating sailed into breathtaking criticism of the interest rate policy he had helped engineer for the past three years. I've been out of the job five months and interest rates have fallen now by only 1% and I don't think that's been enough. Amongst the many hypocritical statements and sort of actions that Paul took during this period, that had to rank very highly. Um, the uh, position, of course, was that uh, under his uh, treasurership, um, the interest rate, high interest rate stru structure had emerged and uh, he had uh, resisted calls from a number of quarters, maybe correctly, but uh, I'm simply saying he had been a bulwark against what he saw as uh, moving too quickly. Employment Minister and Keating supporter John Dawkins today turned his guns on the left after a weekend of leak and counter leak over his role, or lack of it, in Cabinet's efforts, or lack of them, for the unemployed. Well, I'm not sure that I was deliberately involved in destabilisation. I must say that I was less cautious in what I said uh, than perhaps I would have been under other circumstances. And that, uh, and basically because I thought the, um, there wasn't much future in the government under that leadership and um, therefore um, I thought we were, we were dealing with a government whose days were numbered. When you, uh, you took uh, decisions, you, uh, you expected uh, particularly people who were part of those decisions to, uh, to back you. And when uh, they walked away from the decisions, then you felt that, uh, uh, that you were, were being betrayed. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to stand outside of the RC and uh, fight it out as I did in 87, and I think I gave uh, as much as I, as, as I got. Uh, it's another having uh, become part of a, of a group that necessarily must make difficult decisions and must try to make the numbers add up uh, to be betrayed by uh, people who are, were really your former comrades. You're the top. <laughs> You're the Louvre Museum. You're the top. You're the Coliseum. <laughs> Take a seat and go over there. Oh, the photo opportunity is finished, has it, Paul? Thank you. Paul Keating, yes. Well, well, thank you very much for having me. I love fringe gatherings. <laughs> From the fringe back to the fringe. Keating, meanwhile, was everywhere, lurking in the background, ready to seize the moment. He was presented with a gift from the opposition. It says, fight back, ensuring a fairer share of the cake for all Australians. Yeah. The government was struck dumb. It didn't know what to say to a highly political, uh, ideological document. It was trying to run around and count the sums up and do, a, do an arithmetic reply. The thing to do was an immediate political reply. But I think it basically, I mean, in the end, fight back. Finish Bob off, not me. We should have treated it strictly as a political document and taken it head on politically virtually from day one. We didn't. Um, in, uh, in retrospect, uh, uh, that, uh, that was a mistake. It was one that uh, uh, was made uh, consciously, but, um, uh, well, it was wrong. We had... Uh 
played the games by one set of rules and uh, the rules changed. And once uh, the rules had changed, then in a sense uh, people like John Kerrin and I were sitting ducks. We were always going to be uh, undermined and undercut and that's what occurred and I think uh, that year became a year of uh, an impossible year for, uh, for good government and uh, uh, it, it really in the end had to be, uh, had to be resolved and uh, you know, so I don't uh, feel personally badly about that and I'm sure John Kerrin doesn't. Uh, uh, the uh, issue uh, simply was that uh, uh, good government had been suspended for a period of time while we fought out a leadership struggle. The gross operating, sorry, the gross uh, share rose, gross, uh, what's GOS? The figures came out and there wasn't growth recorded by the um, statistician, so it wasn't going to be uh, an easy press conference. And I'd written down GOS, um, uh, which is a measure of gross operating surplus, and there's another term around that is very close to it called gross profit share and I just simply froze on the S. It's as simple as that. Good afternoon and welcome to Canberra. Now over to the Prime Minister who's just about to announce that he's dumping John Kerrin as Treasurer. Prime Minister, was it your decision to remove Mr Kerrin or did he decide to go himself? It was my decision but let me say this. Uh, I uh, spoke to Mr Kerrin by phone this morning uh, from Sydney. I indicated I would like to see him this morning. I put the position to him and I can't speak highly enough of John Kerrin. Uh, we had the problems, of course, that uh, with, with John who had the problems, John Kerrin who had the problems in, in Treasury, who was very much undermined in, in what was a difficult task uh, by uh, the, uh, the attitude of the Keating forces. I mean, uh, when one thinks back of the, uh, at the, uh, the nervousness, the extreme nervousness the mistakes that were made by Paul when he was first there. No allowance made by him and his forces for, uh, uh, for Kerrin in that situation. By that time, due to the way I was handling the media, that I thought um, that was probably a proper decision and um, it wasn't one I particularly resisted. When he, the moment he decided to dismiss John Kerrin, which brought then the visit by the six ministers was probably the start of the end of his leadership and then fight back overlaying it just sort of finished it off. Good morning, this is AM and I'm Maxine McHugh in Canberra. It's now widely anticipated that senior federal ministers who had previously been Hawke supporters will approach Mr Hawke and ask him to stand down from the job he has held for almost nine years. The media was right. Hawke's closest colleagues were blunt. Pull out Digger, the dogs are pissing on your swag. And it's just a, an old quintessentially Australian way of saying some signals are so strong some forms of momentum are so inevitable, whether you like them or not, that the dignified thing to do is to bow to that inevitability and to, and to retire gracefully. Uh, it was not a message, unfortunately, that Bob was very receptive to at that stage. I mean, we were all reluctant to give in what we saw as destabilisation and political buckmail. But on the other hand, none of us then believed that there would be much difference in terms of electoral prospect between Hawke and Keating. Um, and that for Hawke's own sake, if this destabilisation was to go on, it's better to get out then and get out on top. Back of our minds, Labor Party needs some icons. I certainly had reached the judgment at that time, along with all the rest that uh, for our, and we all had our own views about this, uh, but the time had come for him to go. I suppose some, would have, um, some, some of us would have liked at that meeting for Bob to have uh, given us the easy way out. Um, though it wasn't easy for any one of us, I think, uh, in terms of balancing not just the political but also the personal uh, considerations involved. But we did want him to understand that there was no point 
in ringing any of us individually or getting us in collectively in a week's time if, if a challenge took place and said, well, you've got to get the numbers here between the lot of you, because we had to tell him we didn't think we could do that, and we did that. So then he knew. And I, I wanted them to understand, and I think they did, certainly they did in, in the end, that I was not staying on because I wanted the job. Uh, that uh, it was the job that fascinated me and I just wanted to stick there. I told them and they came to accept that I had a profound belief that I had the best chance, certainly better than Paul Keating, of leading the government to victory at the next election. Uh, at the end of those discussions, the Prime Minister uh, expressed the view to the senior ministers in attendance that he intended to remain leader of the Labor Party until the next election. Senior ministers endorsed that position and that is the situation. I couldn't believe the bloody result when the, when the, you know, the brave six marched in <laughs> and then marched out with Kim giving the doorstop, ple pledging everyone's eternal loyalty to the leader. That was a bad idea. I think that um, certainly it was a bad idea if it couldn't be done in secrecy. You could, he was finished. And I mean, it's, and I've been there too. I mean, you can, you can recognise the smell, the smell of death. And you can. It comes off people, you know. And Hawke gave that off every time. You, you knew he was finished. Absolutely finished. Then on December 18th, Keating's chief backer, Graham Richardson, told Robert Ray that a petition was being organised for a special caucus meeting to challenge Hawke. The Prime Minister considered calling a meeting himself and ambushing his opponents. We said you could do the other thing, of course, Bob. You could do this all very clean. An announce a caucus meeting for the leadership yourself. No show and tell ballots, no show of hands, no one needs to sign a petition. Within 10 minutes, Hawke had adopted this as the clean way of doing it. Hawke will face the Labour Party caucus within the hour to make one last appeal for the right to take the government to his fifth election as Prime Minister. Tonight's ballot has been called on by Mr Hawke, who says the issue should be resolved in the least disruptive manner. When caucus meets soon, he'll resign and contest a secret ballot against Paul Keating. Labour caucus members are filing into the ALP party room. Time will tell. The end of the Hawke era is near, with Paul Keating's supporters confident he'll be the new Prime Minister tonight. Bob went to the uh, rostrum and said that uh, it was undoubtedly the case that the Australian media wanted a change of Prime Ministership. But it was also undoubtedly the case that the party wanted him to stay. And he said, we should let the party's will prevail. Hard men and women of the Labor Party, lots of people were wiping tears, and some were, were, were close to positively just weeping. Um, and it was, it was a combination of all of those things. Um, some people were weeping at the appalling a thing that had happened, Bob Hawke was defeated, they were weeping for him. The Parliamentary Labour Party have just elected a new leader, consequently a new Prime Minister of Australia. Paul Keating uh, polled five votes ahead of Bob Hawke, 56 to 51. What Thank you very did much. Keating say to caucus, Senator? Uh, I guess the uh, most memorable part of the meeting that sticks in my mind <laughs> was uh, how some of the uh, those who'd been most uh, vehement in their desire for change um, broke down. And uh, I suppose there was always a little bit of scepticism about my emotion. But most remarkable to me was the way some of these people broke down and most particularly uh, John Dawkins, who broke down completely 
there in the caucus room in my presence. Oh, well, I think if, um, if, if Bob had uh, won the, the leadership uh, ballot, the second one, then uh, I think he would only have won it by a handful of votes. I think uh, his position, the government's position, would have been untenable. And I certainly think the position of those of us who were active uh, campaigners for a change would also have been untenable. And I, for one, would have left the government. Graham said that when he returned from his uh, summer break, it would be his intention to resign from the Cabinet as Minister for Social Security. And we sat there and ticked off a list of Keating Cabinet Ministers who would probably resign as well. In my own mind, I think all of them would have walked. And that, had that occurred, the uh, Hawke government would have simply disintegrated. I remember looking up at the photos of Labor leaders on the wall and thinking, well, Bob's photo will be there in a matter of, uh, a matter of weeks. And Bob was in tears by this stage. And uh, there were two queues formed as the meeting broke up. A queue of Hawke people uh, congratulating him, commiserating with him, and a queue of Keating people. And uh, I will not forget the look in Bob's eyes as I shook his hand. Uh, there is no doubt that there was a burning anger still present in him, a deep resentment of the fact that he'd lost the leadership. And then uh, we gave Hawke uh, three or four minutes to compose himself and 38 members of parliament walked back to his office hall. That long 400 yard walk down a corridor. It was a very emotional moment. Uh, but we wanted to stay behind and show our support for him. You know the result of the, uh, of the caucus ballot which uh, resulted in the uh, election of uh, Paul Keating and I want to say here as I said to the caucus that uh, Paul Keating uh, will have uh, my total support this new Keating Labor government will have my total support Specifically, what's your plans for the future and where do you think you, you went wrong so, so much so that you were voted out of office? I thank you for that opening charitable question. Uh, um, well, uh, um, the first part of the question, what am I going to be doing? Well, uh, if uh, this was uh, uh, 11 years ago, uh, I'd be getting uh, pretty thoroughly drunk. <laughs> but fortunately, <laughs> fortunately for me, and even more fortunately for others, <laughs> that, is, that is 11 years ago, and uh, the only beer that will be passing my lips will be the totally non-alcoholic variety. The day after the ballot, the atmosphere in Hawke's suite was one of restrained sorrow resigned activity. There was packing to do. Labor's caucus had laid waste to its most successful leader. In his last interview in the Prime Minister's suite on December 20, 1991, Hawke was exhausted, hurt. You've taken the party to victory four times and no one's ever looked like doing that before. And, uh, you know, the objective evidence from those who've studied it is that it was Hawke that got the party across the line. And um, you don't feel that it's uh, the most fitting recognition of that to uh, be uh, beaten in a ballot for leadership, that I think the party has made a great mistake in denying itself the best opportunity of beating the Conservatives at the most important time for them to be beaten. Hazel Hawke, for the last time departing the suite she had shared for nine years, mourned memories that had now been defaced. 
It's left a sadness because uh, for a while, as we all know, that partnership worked very well and the, uh, the um, relationships with the family were very pleasant and uh, um, it's just one of those things that in politics, the politics seems to take over the personal relationships because it's, it's, uh, it's a very strong and intense process. Um, I feel disappointment, some hurt, I don't think anger, but I do feel disappointed that that was the way that Bob went. I, Paul John Keating, do swear that I will well and truly serve Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I don't think anyone could turn around uh, our electoral fortunes in December 1991. It wasn't Robinson Crusoe on that, but there'll be a lot of rewriting of history about that. A lot of people say, yes, they're absolutely certain. I certainly was certain we couldn't, I was wrong. I thought, well, you know, I've sort of, uh, I'm sitting here in a sort of uh, such a difficult position. Um, did I do the right thing? But uh, I used to think without, without, and I say this without any uh, disrespect to Bob or his political abilities, which have been substantial, I don't think he showed any likelihood of catching Hewson or sparring him properly. So I thought, whatever this, whichever way this is going to work out, I'm sure I'm going to do better at this than Bob would have done. I mean, you know, I mean, he's going, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he's going tropo. Why won't you call an early election? The, the answer is, mate, mate, because I want to do you slowly. I want to do you slowly. Keating's main tactic was to psychologically crack Liberal leader John Hewson. The battle in Parliament was intensely personal. His main weapon was his One Nation blueprint for the future. Released in February 1992, it seemed to represent a new direction for the arch-free market man of old. With our strategy, within four years, the federal budget will return to surplus. And we'll have created another 800,000 jobs. One Nation set a direction. I think Keating stamped on, on the place in, in February of 1992 that uh, there was a now a change in thinking, that the government that had cut and cut and cut was now prepared to spend money, not just to get Australia going again, but it was a recognition that infrastructure spending had fallen behind and we had to do it. And that was a major change. And everything we've done since then follows that direction. We were fitted up with the policies and rhetoric of the 80s. We had to change that and change our position. Now, that's what we succeeded in doing over the, the 15 months to the election. Reordering the debate, saying there was a role for government. The all-powerful Treasury, which Keating had for years courted and embraced, was now discredited because of the recession. Keating believed he had previously been too prone to take the advice of Treasury and the Reserve Bank. Yes, oh, that's probably a fair comment. Now, they were making their best judgments, but their best judgments were not good enough. That's the bank. The Treasury, the Treasury was saying, the economy's going to recover, we don't need a fiscal stimulus. That was wrong. The judgments lacked guile. Not just lacked an economic understanding, they lacked guile. Well, all right, you call that a mistake. We all shared in that mistake. But it only convinced me that what I should do as a Prime Minister was run much more of that policy myself. In other words, be less likely to take as given advice from the bureaucracy. It's official, one million jobless. And according to John Hewson, that means one million reasons for getting rid of Paul Keating. Unemployment appeared to be a political disaster. Virtually nobody in the Labor Party believed they could win the 1993 election. But Keating destroyed an opposition that had fatally handicapped itself by pushing a goods and services tax. The truth is, they kill themselves a bit. I mean, they, there weren't too many Liberal feet left because they'd been shitting themselves in them for a long time. And 
uh, you know, Houston standing up in front of rallies with that Labor's got to go leading the chant was just stupid. And uh, that, and, uh, and not only was it stupid, it was stupid often because it, it was a kind of militant stupidity. I mean, there was a determination to show this stupidity off as often as possible. Welcome back to the National Tally Room here in Canberra. We're coming live to you all around Australia in this uh, special National Nine coverage tonight of Judgment Day. I'd uh, say that uh, Labor has won the election and um, this is um, a result which uh, I think uh, Labor supporters all around the country are entitled to be very, uh, very pleased about from the Prime Minister right through. Thank you, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, this is the sweetest victory of all. This is the sweetest. This is a victory for the true believers. If ever a political leader or a political party talk about people's wins, you can always, you know, look somewhat askance. But this, if ever there was one, this was a people's win. This, and I think the election was a great victory for them. And the extent that I played a role, and I'm very, very happy about it. Very happy about it. Look, we won this election by 1%, essentially. And we've got to remember that there's 49% of people out there didn't vote for us, so the margin's small. Um, we'll always have that reality hanging over our head. I think we're getting a little carried away in the uh, post-election glory about how well we've done and how badly the Liberals have done. Keating's warriors were vindicated by the result. For the Hawke supporters, though, the events of December 1991 remain a blot on history. Uh, those who wanted to... Uh, change of leader because they believed electoral success uh, was more likely under Keating the Hawke approved right. Uh, but there's never an absolute right or wrong in those things. I apologise for no, no role I played in it because I think there are other principles involved. The other principle of, uh, of not uh, knocking off an existing Prime Minister, I'm sure it's one that has probably more converts these days than did at the time. this hero, it's the most powerful hero Australia's ever seen. Keating has more power in the Labor Party than Bob Hawke ever dreamed of having. And that too will affect him, I suppose. Thus far, the power's been used wisely. Um, he doesn't need kingmakers, he doesn't need factions. There's no, no leader, the Labor Party has not needed somebody, and I don't think he needs anyone at the moment. For 11 years, Paul Keating's ambition was like an incoming tide. First, Bob Hawke was engulfed, then the opposition. The triumph was dazzling, creating room for enemies to embrace. I just say this, you can't have a fifth election victory without a fourth, and the bloke who gave it to us and his wife, Bob and Hazel, here tonight, thanks for coming back. I guess it took real political skill over the years for, for Keating and Hawke to, to be able to uh, present this, this public display of unity, which was obviously there uh, for long periods. When there were tensions beneath the surface, they still were able to cooperate uh, fully in the parliament and appear to be a very effective team. But they had very little regard for each other privately. I knew that uh, it was important for the party that the relationship between us uh, be effective, uh, that whatever strains arose from the ambitions of the man um, and his quirks of personal behaviour, the way he treated most of his colleagues and just about everyone with contempt, um, that that had to be, be harnessed. My job was to keep Humpty Dumpty together, to keep the government happy and to keep it going. And that meant I had to manage 
my relationship with Bob in a way that kept the government happy, relaxed, confident, as though we were in charge and we were a team. And we pulled that off from 1983, largely, until 1990. There was something else to celebrate on this night. For too long, Labor had danced to a different tune, to the discordant clash of two overwhelming ambitions, when the only true belief Hawke and Keating had was in their own destiny, when Australia suffered miserably, and when the ranks of the true believers became thinner as a result. I think that uh, the fact that there are now at the uh, end of almost a decade of, uh, of government uh, very high levels of unemployment, you would have to uh, uh, put that down as the most serious uh, failure. We presided over the, the great, and if I think one can say, historic post-war transition in Australia, economic transition. I mean, Australia is now an open, competitive, market trading economy. The big failure which caught up with us in the end, of course, was to get on top of the balance of payments problem which has been a chronic problem in Australia for the last 150 years probably, which occasionally becomes acute. In other words, it's not that the economy grew too fast. It didn't grow enough in the right sector. It's not just a closed economy shipping a bit of wheat and wool. It's an economy now where the fastest growing export is elaborately transformed manufacturers, which has a substantial research and development base, which has now a strong education system powering that along. Uh, which, is, which is competitive, which has got low inflation, which has got a you know, uh, you know, strong fiscal position, um, good social policy, good safety net. It's economic performance, it's social reconstruction, it's foreign policy, uh, it's uh, creation of greater equity, it's targeting of social uh, welfare on those really in need, uh, its policies in regard to women. Um, whichever way you looked at, we had been, I believed, a very, very good government. For Hawke and Keating, history will make all Australians true believers. The whispering sound of the jobless shuffle will be consumed in a roar of triumph. For them, opening Australia to the world is the justification of their power. But the strategy's final test is to come. Australia still lives drastically beyond its means. Failure to solve this would cause history's verdict to be harsh indeed.